Hey guys, and here's what we're jumping into next. Neurological diagnostic testing and positioning. This comes up on your examinations a lot, right? Uh, you got all those great pictures that they'll flash up using alternate formats in nursing school, right? And you need to be able to decipher like, oh man, which position is that, right? So we're gonna work on that and talk about some of the diagnostic tests that go hand in hand with it, okay? So here we go. At Cliff Notes, what are we doing? Helping students see through larger concepts, right? And I am Cliff Davis, Associate Dean of Nursing and Advanced Medical Surgical Professor. All right, what is a seizure? An electrical storm in the brain. Wow, it is, whew, if you've ever seen one, you've seen how like frightening it can be to like watch a person go through that. Some people, it is it's major. They might bite their tongue and you see blood in their mouth and these kinds of things. Uh, but yeah, so what do you do, right? If we aren't careful, we don't teach you enough of what you should do, right? So, all right. What position should you place the patient who is having a seizure? And you say, well, here, first of all, write it down, right? <laughs> don't just watch the video and just guess, like, oh, I don't know. Uh, send me file it, I know. Write it down somewhere, all right? Or put it in your phone or something. Okay, so what are we, what are we saying? It is lateral, yes. Check out the cute little guy. Hey, by the way, they have seizures too. Don't let them fool you. Okay, so lateral or sideline. Right? Now, why lateral? Because when they have a seizure, they tend to make a copious amount of secretions, right? So, the body's seizing and locking up. And in that locking up process, they make extra secretions. So, if they're laying on their back, they're choking and gagging on those secretions. And unfortunately, there are too many lay people out there who don't know how to properly respond. So it's very important that we get the knowledge out there. And so you're watching them, they've got the person on their back, the person sounds like they're choking and they, they kind of are on their secretions, but people are assuming in their mind that person's choking on their tongue. And people go fishing in their mouths for the tongue. So you got people putting the, you know, spoons and wallets and things in people's mouths. I watched some of this stuff in the past before I even knew what was going on. I started studying nursing. And boy, I thought they were doing the right thing. But years later, it's like, oh my God. <laughs> right? Don't go fishing in their mouth. So, you know, turn them on their side. They're not choking on their tongue. No. They might bite their tongue. You might see some blood, but they're not choking on their tongue. All right, what other interventions, right? So th this is it. Right, the interventions are, are really good. It's just important to not just have knowledge, but what? Know how to use that knowledge, right? And help people. So what other interventions, right? So we said turn them on their side, lateral, okay? But now we want to add, protect the patient's head, right? As they start thrashing around and things like that, and you got chairs and tables and things like that nearby, they can easily hit their head up against that stuff. So it's very important that you protect that head and, and maybe have people help you to move furniture items and things like that out of the way. The other thing is loosen clothing around the person's neck. Yeah, when they, when they, they, they lock up in a position, if what they're wearing is too tight, it could cut off their circulation. So are their airway as well. So here's a great response. This lady is doing all the right things here. So she's got the patient on the side. She's protecting his head. And check that out. Real important. Right around that airway, what? No buttons. She's, she's under the buttons. So and keeping a good eye on it. Good job for her. Okay. Now, all right, quiz time, right? Name that rigidity. Go for it. <laughs> Pause the video if you need to. Name that rigidity. Okay. And the corticate would be A. The cerebate would be B. And two goofy ways to learn that. All right, you know what I mean? Goofy, corny, go for it, whatever it is. It works. Okay. So the corticate, we think of court. And what position would you be in in court? Uh, please, Your Honor, I'll never do it again. <laughs> right? Hands like that. 
and this area. What position will you be in when you graduate from school, right? And down at your side, cap and gown. What? Bum, 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 bum. That's right. Hi, mama. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the cerebrate and the cortical. Okay. Now, when we want to get a visualization of that seizure, we have a patient scheduled for an EEG. Now, as soon as we hear EEG, our mind sort of flashes quickly to EKG. That was what? Electrocardiogram. We'll get to that in another video. This is electro encephalogram right yeah encephalogram so we're placing the electrodes on the client's scalp and notice we did not need to shave the client right <laughs> you don't, don't do that yeah you don't need to shave the client we're not just going to part the hair right <laughs> just imagine right the night before you you sent them to my barber right <laughs> like i want to make sure they had a good study i got all of it out though anyway all right, EEG prep, food and medications, right? So uh, when it comes to EEG, EEG is like the opposite of most things. Surgeries, procedures, things like that, typically the patient has to be NPO, and they can't take their PO medicines in the morning and things like that. Can't have that stuff in their, in their system right before the, the examination or the surgery. EEG is the opposite, where they can eat. They can have their meds, but there's some exceptions, right? And we're going to take that E and E off of there and learn a little bit. So, uh, they can have anything to eat, what, E? Except things that have caffeine in it. So, right, no coffee, but watch out, that caffeine list can be impressive sometimes, right? Coffee isn't the only thing. Right? So they can't have any caffeine on the day of the test because that may affect the results. So no caffeine. And they can take their usual medications, right? Even their PO meds the morning before. What? E, except, right? They can't take their benzodiazepines and things that have that similar effect. Benzos, benzodiazepines, what? Valium, Ativan, Xanax, those guys. Right? The benzos. Hold those. All right, good. Except two exceptions. Now, uh, when it comes to their hair care, they should wash their hair the night before the exam. However, they can't do their usual drill of applying conditioners and gels and these kinds of things that are going to interfere with the, the placement and the sticking of the electrode. All right? Now, it says here the doctor might ask you to sleep less or avoid sleep. I'm used to working in facilities where it was our job partially to keep that person awake, right? So the more that person is awake or experiencing insomnia, right, more likely that they're going to have a seizure during the study. So we want to capture that seizure. And, by the way, here's a, a readout of what that seizure would look like in an EEG. So an electroencephalogram, it looks a whole lot like an EKG, although it's missing the V leads and that kind of stuff, right, that set up. Uh, but here, we can see where the patient had a seizure. So great, they were able to catch it, okay? All right now, now on your paper, in your phone, iPad, whatever it is you're using, right? Name the meninges. Ah, well, hold up, hold up. Okay, because we've done this before in a previous video. So, that other time, we started from the outside and worked our way in. This time, we're going to flip that, and we're going to have you start from the inside and work your way out. So, what's the innermost meninge, right? And then work your way out. Now, we know that the meninges, what's their purpose? Uh, protection of your central nervous system is one of their purposes. And... They, in that protection, they provide sort of padding for the central nervous system, right? And with that in mind, they actually spell out pad, right? What? PM monitor on the innermost uh, uh, meninge, and then we've got arachnoid, and then we've got the dura mater, right? So PIA, we know, means soft. Mater means mother, soft mother. Arachnoid, why? Because that one tends to look like a bunch of little spider webs, right? Uh, so like arachnophobia. 
And then dura mater, durable, right? Hard, hard mother. So pad, the meninges. Now, what that helps us to realize, right, uh, is that those can become infected. And when those become infected, the client comes down with, you guessed it, meningitis, right? And with that meningitis, you'll see that the doctor or nurse practitioner, right, or the provider is going to do a couple of assessment positionings with your client to further assess them and test them. So, which, what's the name of these, what, of these assessment signs and tests? So fill that in. And A would be Koenig's sign. Koenig's sign. But I want to point out to you that with Koenig's sign, what is the provider manipulating? The patient's what? Knee. So K and K. With Koenig's sign, they're manipulating the patient's knee. With Brudzinski's sign, the provider's manipulating their neck and their back. Rudzinski's back, Koenig knee, right? Study smart. All right, next. So those were the signs of meninges and what should we typically find in CSF? So CSF, in this case, cerebral spinal fluid. What are the typical components of cerebral spinal fluid? Got to know that, all right? Pause this video if you need to. What three things jump out at you right away? And that should be glucose. The presence of glucose. All right now, one of the signs that I didn't do a slide for, but because you're checking this out, we're going to go ahead and add that in. And what that is, is battle sign. Uh, students have been letting me know they've been like seeing that a lot on the NCLEX lately. So a battle sign, a person's been in a, a battle, a fight. And when you've got a client who's got bruising behind their, behind their ear, on this bump right here behind their ear, what's that bump behind the ear called? Right? And it's called the mastoid process. Good, good. That mastoid bump. Now, this is also the base of the skull. And when they've got a bruise right there, this could potentially be cracked open. And when this is cracked open, your client might be dabbing inside their ear with a piece of tissue, right? And asking you for tissue. And then you give them the tissue. And they're doing that while you're interviewing them. And, you know, so you say you got to do a fight. Oh, yes, I yes, man, I did. Uh, I don't know why, why the guy hit me, right? Uh, right. Uh, you're sitting back watching the patient give themselves an infection. They should not be touching CSF. That should be a sterile liquid. So what we need to do is test that for glucose, right? Yeah, we need to send that for testing, for glucose. We could potentially get a sample of that and test it using a glucometer, right? Typically drainage from the ear should not have sugar in it. Okay, we get a readout from the glucometer we're looking at what? Glucose. Another thing that we can do is if any of that were to be on a sterile gauze, right? If you've got enough of that on a sterile gauze, when it dries, it makes sort of a halo. Now typically, fluid would just dry. But if it has sugar in it, if it has glucose in it, it'll dry and have sort of a halo pattern on it. That's a halo test, yeah. Okay, so in addition to the glucose, Right? We've got protein and we've got WBCs. Okay, but let's break it down so that you understand. We don't want to just like, okay, glucose, fruit, protein, uh, WBC. Like, no, 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 no. Uh, let's, let's slow it down and break it down. All right, what's happening here? Glucose. Why glucose? Because your cells and your central nervous system need what? Energy. So glucose. What's next? Protein. Protein is typically used for tissue repair, right? So, energy, tissue repair, and then the last one, what? Defense. So we got a small amount of white blood cells, so not nearly the level we'd be looking at with like blood and things like that. This is like white blood cells in your cerebral spinal fluid, and so we got a small amount of those. 
glucose, protein, WBC. All right. But now, uh, when we're dealing with that CSF, in the case of a diagnostic study known as a myelogram, right, which is very similar to a lumbar puncture, however, the key here is what? Gram. This is a study where we're going to be injecting this time. Instead of taking fluid out, we're injecting contrast, contrast dye. So we can watch that on x-ray as it travels up or down the patient's spinal column, right? So myelogram, and we're going to get to some of the specifics on that, but notice the position that the client is in. Good. Okay. Now, so we saw the position when the study was being done. But now the issue becomes, right, examination time. And what are they asking? After the study, post-study, what position are you putting them in? Then, for how long? And now, here comes a uh, Mr. Davis study smart strategy, right? So, using our magic number three this time, and we're going to do it like this. Because we're going to turn that letter M from myelogram, we're going to turn that letter M into a 3. So here we go, right? And what? Myelogram. And then what position are you going to be in? You're going to position them from 30 to 45 degrees in terms of elevation in their bed. And for how long? For three hours. So see? From a study smart strategy, we've got what? Three, 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 or alphanumerically what? M, M, M. Study smart. Okay. All right, let's go to another one. So this time we want to look at a lumbar puncture. So similar in approach, right? You got the patient's sideline, all right? But some physicians might opt for a sitting position. I am not crazy about that sitting position. I tell you what, it is so much easier to have someone in a sideline position and to, and to support them or cradle them when they're reacting to the doctor inserting the needle than a person, right? I mean, you, and you don't know who you're dealing with until you, you get there. You know, doctor inserts the needle, guy sitting like that, right? And ah! Right. That is not the time to, you know, the doctor's got something sharp in your back to, you know, spaz, right? So, of, if I've got my choice, I want my patient in that position, not this. All right, but different strokes for different folks, okay? Lumbar punch. All right, now, study smart strategies again. What? Lumbar puncture, but this time we're going to take this letter P, and we're going to turn it into... A, 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 well, we're going to use it as a P, but we also use it as a number six. So here we go, right? So we've got lumbar what? Puncture. And we're putting them in what position? Prone. And for how long? Six hours. So we've got what? P, P, and P upside down. Or, right? Or in the form of six. So study smart. There we go. All right, thank you guys, and especially thank you for liking and subscribing. All right, stay tuned. Continue to study smart. Thanks, guys.